possibility or other like this. I ended up putting in one of my books where you, you go, where a bad guy takes a, an aircraft into the Capitol building during a joint session of Congress, which could effectively decapitate the, you know, the whole government. Uh, and uh, at the time, it seemed rather humorous. You know, I, I, I said, surely you've thought about things like this. And he said, well, to the best of my knowledge, nobody in my office has looked at this, but I promise you Monday morning they will be. Uh, presumably, they've been, you know, they've, they've considered this possibility for some time. But the, the big problem is a person who is willing to, to, to lose his own life in, in, in you know, voluntarily in a, in a terrorist incident, the people like that are fairly rare. Self-preservation is indeed the first law of nature. And a per, you know, not too many people are willing to throw their lives away. And those who do it generally do it for religious reasons because they think there's something good waiting for on the other side of death. Uh, in a case like this, you know, that, that's going to lean people towards uh, talking about, you know, is, is, is Islamic fanatics. But we need to remember, that, you know, Islam is a religion. It's, it's a religion with, with beliefs and not terribly different from Judaism or Christianity. Or they believe in a God of love and justice the same as we do, and they're not all maniacs. And, and religious tolerance is one of the principles of our country. We need to hold on to that principle very tightly right now because it's the principles you hold on to when things are tough that, that really count. Uh, fair yeah, point. This, this, this is, you know, this was an, a, a, an act you know, by a, a small number of, of, of madmen, and uh, madmen don't characterize any any part of humanity. Tom, it's Aaron Brown. When you would talk to these officials uh, in doing the research, did they see an attack of this enormity, or were they more concerned with these sort of uh, devastating but smaller kind of hit and miss attacks than we've seen over the last seven, eight years? Well, you don't ordinarily expect terrorists to, do, to display this degree of expertise. You can fly an airplane is not all that easy. Uh, kidnapping an aircraft, you know, hijacking an airplane, is particularly you know, with the safeguard you have the airports right now, is not a trivial exercise. But unfortunately, you know, the, the, the security you have at airports is is not perfect because nothing human beings do is perfect. Somebody thought very, you know, very carefully and, and hard and long about this, and then they got some, some madmen to actually take control of the aircraft. Uh, Tom, stay with me for a second. We, we, yes, we uh, a few moments ago, uh, told our viewers that United Airlines was concerned about another of uh, United lost a flight near Pittsburgh earlier today. An official said they were also concerned about United Flight 175, Boston to Los Angeles. And now we have reports that concern was justified. A second plane has gone down, United Flight 70, 175. Again, that was from Boston to L.A. Uh, and as you look at the Pentagon, which was also hit by a plane, earlier in the day. Jeff? Yes, it, Tom, you were mentioning that, that uh, it, this is such a rare act, and yet we now know of at least four commercial airlines that apparently were hijacked and either crashed or crashed into buildings, causing death and havoc of an unimaginable scale. So whatever, whoever is behind this, this is of a dimension that literally dwarfs even fantasy. Big, but my dream, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, didn't get quite this large. Uh, it, it's not, generally speaking, it's not credible to think that you're going to find, a, you know, a, a more than one person who's willing to, to do something like this because people who are willing to throw their lives away are fairly rare. In this case, uh, they got, you know, somebody who was well organized and, and, and produced a well planned and reasonably well executed operation. Well, it, now we need to find out who it was and to go after them. But that's you know that's going to take time. But we do have the people to do that if they have the proper support from the executive branch of the government and from uh, and from the general population of our country to identify, locate, and deal with uh, the people who perform this act. The president uh, said earlier today, shortly after the Trade Center attacks, uh, the president characterizing these as terrorist attacks, and said that the United States government will do whatever. It is necessary to hunt down those people responsible. I think it is fair to say, uh, Tom, Jeff, all of uh, you on the line here, it is fair to say that what we know is that this is an extraordinarily large operation, and what we don't know, in a way, is just how big it is. Uh, 
it seems that at each passing moment or so, we get another report of another incident, and, and our instinct tells us that they are all connected. Uh, we have a number of planes down, two American Airlines jets, two United jets down. We have a plane that hit the Pentagon. We have two that hit the Trade Center. Uh, you're talking about something that is, I, I think it's fair to say, Jeff, it is beyond anything any of us could have imagined. could possibly have imagined. I think that with those of us who who dealt with Oklahoma City, those of us who dealt with the Trade Center here in '93, as we both did, uh, you say that is that is awful what happened, and you look at what appears to be playing out today, and we have no idea, no idea yet what the loss of life will be certainly in the hundreds. We know that hospitals here in New York are overwhelmed with people being brought there all over the city of New York and beyond. The, the only piece of news that is the least bit, I guess, uh, reassuring is that, is that there is no report of any kind of chemical result. That is, the folks on the ground around the World Trade Center, the rescue crews, the survivors, there is absolutely no indication at this moment that there was any kind of, bio, of bioterrorism involved. Not that what happened here isn't horrific enough. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let me just add on again, small, medium-sized pieces of information as we go. Uh, all airlines in the country are closed down. Uh, all airports in the country are closed down. We now are being told that the U.S.-Mexican border has been sealed. Uh, we don't know if that is just simply part of a plan that the government puts into effect under a worst-case circumstance, this is certainly that, or if there is some specific reason why a decision was made to shut down that border. Uh, our, our senior White House correspondent, John King, on the phone. John. John. Uh, John King, can you hear me? It's Aaron. I hear you, Aaron. Uh, what have you got to report for us? Aaron, I'm standing across from the White House. I'm told by Secret Service and administration sources that all of the principals, all the protectees, meaning the president, the vice president, the first lady, and Mrs. Cheney, are safe. They do not want us disclosing their locations, but I am told by a senior administration official that the plan and the priority is to get President Bush back to the White House as soon as they believe it is safe. Now, there are both operational and political reasons for wanting to do that. The White House Situation Room, in the view of White House officials, is the best place from which to monitor events and direct any operations. And that is a fortified structure within the White House compound where we know the Vice President was when everyone else was evacuated from the premises earlier. Again, the Secret Service does not want to confirm for us for security reasons or administration officials the same. Tell us where those people are now, although I was told a short time ago the Vice President is still in a position to be monitoring and directing the response to these developments, and that the President, who is en route back to Washington, we're told Andrews Air Force Base is on full alert. I was also told that there are extra precautions that were taken to ensure the President's flight back to Washington was a safe one. Now, you can read into that that additional fighter jet escorts, Air Force One always has some escorts with it, that additional fighter jet escorts were put up for that. Now, the political reason they want to get the, back, the president back to the White House is rather obvious. The White House believes this has been a tragic terrorist attack, and they want to send the signal that the president is back on the job at the White House. Priority one, though, officials say, is to guarantee that he can be safely brought back to the White House. And in the past half hour or so, we have seen security precautions on the street, checks, checks being taken out on the street, on the grounds around the White House. There are snipers up on the roofs of the White House itself, including buildings around it and a military helicopter gunship flew over the premises not that long ago, about 15 minutes ago now, and then it circled back over toward the Pentagon, where from my location you can still see smoke coming into the sky from there. But we are told the vice president is still in a position to monitor all this as the president makes his way back. John, thank you. Uh, our senior White House correspondent, John King, as John mentioned, the president 
was in Sarasota, Florida, making his way back to Washington. Whether he'll be taken directly to the White House or not is a little bit unclear. Secret Service wants to make sure the building is safe. It is, I would add, one other symbolic reason why uh, you would want to get the president in the White House, and that's to send a message who's ever responsible for this, that yes, you've caused extraordinary damage and a great deal of tragedy here, but what you haven't done is shut down the American government, the president, will want to get home. Uh, Governor George Pataki of New York joins us on the telephone. Governor, are you there? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, I'm here. What are you hearing from the Trade Center area itself? Well, we're still hearing that there is, it's a horrific situation. We're in desperate need of people to help out with emergency services. Uh, the city team is there, but we've activated our National Guard and our state to uh, relieve the city forces uh, as the afternoon goes on. I've been in touch with the mayor. I've been in touch with the White House. And everything that we can do and everything that can be done is being uh, done at this point. Um, uh, has anyone given you any idea of how many injured we are dealing with down? It's not at this center? point. Uh, it, it, at this point, the sole uh, goal is to try to help as many people as possible to get them to the emergency services, to get them the care they need, to help people who want to leave the area to leave in an orderly way, and to make sure we do everything we can to provide security uh, throughout the city and throughout the state. And Governor Pataki, are, can, can you tell me the degree to which the state's planning for these sorts of tragedies and there's obviously a plan in place and new york is because of its place in the world is obviously a, a, a place you have to consider a target whether that plan envisions something of the magnitude of what has taken place this morning well you plan for any eventuality but you never actually expect to see something of this magnitude but uh, we have coordinated well with the city we're going to continue to make sure we provide all the support we can we do have emergency services and emergency transportation running I know the reports have been inaccurate. We do have uh, limited uh, rail service out of Grand Central to the northern suburbs, limited rail service out of Brooklyn and Queens to Long Island. We're working to make sure that uh, bus service to the extent possible continues, and we're trying to get subway service back on track. It's not there yet, but uh, the coordination has been uh, excellent. It's just an uh, attack of this magnitude. Uh, we just have to focus on responding and helping people at this point. And, and do you have any idea how many people people have been hospitalized or how many hospitals are involved, whether uh, they extend beyond point, the city? Not at this point, but every emergency service, every hospital that uh, can provide assistance is providing assistance. The people have been just uh, terrific in their response, uh, and we're going to continue to make sure that response is as strong as it can be. And Governor, take a moment and tell me, not as the governor necessarily, but as a, as a resident of this state, an important player in the affairs of this state. What you're thinking today? This is an enormous tragedy. I, I have friends in, the, in those towers. I have friends who are there this morning that we haven't heard from. Uh, and our thoughts go to the people who are there, to their families, to all those who are uh, suffering at this, at this time. And we will be there to help, and we will be there to do everything we can to make sure that the support and the services necessary are provided. Governor, thank you. Governor George Pataki joining us here. The National Guard has been activate, activated to support New York City police. Andrea Koppel is uh, on board a uh, flight with the uh, Secretary of State. Andrea, what are you hearing from officials there? Well, Aaron, Secretary Powell has been in Peru since last night. He was here to attend the Organization of American States General Assembly. Obviously, when he got the news of uh, the attacks in the United States, his aides scrambled to, uh, to prepare things for him to leave. We are now, as you say, on board his plane. We're about to take off from Lima to head back to Washington. Uh, while at the OAS uh, General Assembly, Secretary Powell said it was a terrible tragedy that had fallen on all who believe in democracy, but he said that will never kill the spirit of the American people. He also said that America will bring those responsible to justice, Aaron. There was also a minute of silence at the Organization of American States, and Secretary Powell obviously had to abruptly change his plans. He was supposed to be leaving uh, Peru later this afternoon to head on to Colombia for his first trip there. But obviously, uh, the attacks in the United States have changed that, uh, and he's headed back to uh, to Washington. Aaron? Uh, Andrea, give me a sense of the secretary's 
demeanor. I mean, we, we know this is a man who has been through a lot in his life, has seen a lot in his life. Did he appear shaken to you? I would say that Secretary Powell is someone who doesn't show uh, his emotions in that way. This is a man with 35 years of military experience, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, former national security advisor himself, who's seen uh, a lot in his day. And so I would say that obviously he appears somber, uh, very serious, but in terms of any other emotion, I would say that uh, he's able to, to uh, keep that very close to his chest. Andrea, thank you. Andrea Koppel, uh, flying back with the Secretary of State uh, from uh, South America, her colleague Judy Woodruff in Washington. Judy. Aaron, uh, we have joining us now on the phone from the Pentagon, our military affairs correspondent, Jamie McIntyre. Jamie, you, I understand you are inside the perimeter of where the commercial jetliner came down at the Pentagon. Well, it appears that we may have lost the phone connection with Jamie McIntyre. We're going to try to get that restored immediately. Jamie, Jamie, are you there? Now we have uh, Bob Franken, our Washington correspondent, joining us from the Pentagon. Uh, Bob, uh, tell us what you are seeing there. Well, what we're seeing, of course, in back of me is the smoke that's coming from the west side of the Pentagon, where, uh, as uh, we now know, a plane, which is believed to have been a jumbo jet, crashed into the Pentagon. It has left a hole. There was a collapse of that side of the building. You're seeing the smoke, of course, uh, to my rear, uh, reporting from an east side vantage point along a highway that's a major artery here. It is also a place where there has been a constant alert looking skyward, uh, concerns, repeated concerns that another plane was heading this way up uh, toward the Potomac. These have been concerns that have been out there for a couple of hours. Uh, none of them have been realized yet. Of course, the tragedy was that at about 9.20 this morning, Eastern time, that plane crashed into the west side of the Pentagon. You can see overhead uh, frequently helicopters, helicopters that are circling the area, of course, looking to provide some visual sighting in case anybody, any sort of invader, anything like that, wants to take to the air. It's interesting, these helicopters also will hover on the ground. There are any number of highways here, and they would be looking for suspicious vehicles, that type of thing. We are told there are casualties at the Pentagon. We have not been able to get an accurate figure. Uh, we are not exactly sure at the moment of the whereabouts of the Secretary of Defense, but uh, the building has uh, virtually been evacuated, if not totally evacuated. There is heavy security there, uh, investigations going on uh, as they try and uh, find out what happened. We constantly see sirens uh, and hear sirens and see ambulances go by, many of them from Walter Reed Military Hospital on the other side of Washington, clearly going in there to uh, help with uh, whatever casualties there are. We also have seen a couple of times F-16s, at least one F-16, flying overhead a couple of times. That was reported as to be the case of the Pentagon scrambling fighter jets in case another plane was heading this way. But as I said, right now, there has been no evidence of another plane coming this way. They're on full alert, of course, and trying to now recover from the severe damage that hit the other side of the building. Judy? All right, Bob Frank, and I just want to remind our viewers that the section of the Pentagon that was hit was between the 4th, 5th, and 6th corridors. This confirmed... Uh, apparently a little earlier today by Wesley Clark, General Clark, a former NATO chief. Uh, he said from what he could tell, it appears it was this was the Army section of the Pentagon, planning and logistics area where certainly Army leaders would have been uh, working in their offices. I want to read for you now a statement from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, quoting, We are outraged at this cowardly attack on the people of the United States. Our heartfelt prayers are with the victims and their families, and we stand strongly united behind the president as our commander-in-chief. And I want to clarify that this is a statement by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That's, it's actually, I want to clarify that. This is from the leadership of the Congress. Uh, I misunderstood uh, when I was handed this just a moment ago. And continuing, congressional leaders, we will work with the president to ensure that the full resources of the United States government are brought to bear to protect the American people and to punish the perpetrators of these unconscionable acts. May God bless America. And just quickly, before I go back to Aaron Brown in New York, hospitals in Washington uh, dealing with the casualties from the Pentagon, Washington Hospital Center, 29 patients, uh, a blood shortage, we are being told, in Washington. So any of you who are able to get to a hospital, 
anywhere in the Washington area, it is very possible that there is a need for blood to be donated. So we will just put that information out there as well. Aaron, now back to you in New York. Judy, thanks. We now are being told that uh, Los Angeles International Airport, LAX, has been evacuated. Again, this is another one of those multi-terminal airports. It's an enormous airport, and that that is being evacuated. At least one of the flights, and perhaps two, if memory serves me, uh, that has gone down today was headed towards Los Angeles, one towards San Francisco. We also have a report that Disney World in Orlando uh, has been evacuated. Um, Someone said to me a moment ago, before the day is over, everything's going to be shut down. And that seems to, to be where we're headed. Uh, CNN's Richard Roth, on the, uh, Richard Roth, rather, is on the streets of New York, and yeah. he can join us now. Richard, what can you tell us? Aaron, New Yorkers think they've seen everything, but uh, they'll never, they'll say they, they're amazed at what has happened. Stunned. Right now behind me, what normally would be the World Trade Center is no more. A huge cloud of white smoke. And right now it's like a war zone. Thousands of New Yorkers streaming north. The mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani, has told everyone to get north of Canal Street. We're several miles north of it. Uh, right now, New Yorkers are trying to get out of Manhattan. There's a ferry on the west side going to New Jersey. It's really the only access out. The mayor advising uh, that people should take the subways. We have seen dozens of emergency vehicles, hundreds, firemen being bussed in, decontamination vans coming in, called for blood donations. Uh, New Yorkers, their faces, their expressions, stunned, amazed right now. With us, several of those people who witnessed some of the carnage today. Tell us what you saw when you exited the subway station due to a lack of smoke. Eileen. Um, it was very smoky, and then we exited on Church Street out of the Path train station. Um, I crossed over to Church and uh, Fulton, and I was trying to get a cell phone. I was trying to get up the block, and I turned around and saw this tremendous fire. I actually thought it was a bomb. I couldn't see a plane. And I saw people jumping out of, off the building, many, many people just jumping. And in a panic, I had my bag and my cell phone and everything, and I was trying to find a phone because the cell phone was it working? Everybody was screaming. Everybody was running. The cops were trying to maintain the calm. And in that haste, people were stampeding. People started screaming that there was another plane coming. I didn't see the plane, but I turned around, and it just the second building just exploded. And again, all the debris was flying towards us. There was a woman on the ground with her baby. People were stampeding the baby. Myself and another man threw ourselves over the baby and pushed into the building. I got up, and I just ran. I ran towards City Hall, and I said, oh, God, why am I running there? And then I started to run towards the water. And then uh, I was by probably Spring Street or, or, or uh, I'm sorry, Prince Street. I was at a payphone, and I heard the rumbling. I thought it was another bomb. I thought it was another building close to me. And then I just uh, ran from the payphone. The man is grabbing me back, telling me to stay here. You're safe. I was like, no way. I'm getting out of here. Go north. And then I ran into a shoe store because I wanted to call my husband. That's all I wanted to do was let him know I was alive because he knew I was in the world trade. And um, I got my office, and they connected me to my husband. And then we heard the second fall of the World Trade Center. And I, I'm astonished by the bombing. I just want to make a statement that these New York policemen and firemen, God bless them, they kept us calm. They tried so hard to keep us moving north. And it was just absolute, absolute horror. It was horror. And when you look back there, what would be the no World it's Trade Center? It's devastating. I can't even look back. My six-year-old just last week asked my husband and I to take him to the observation deck. And it's gone. And you know what? Americans will persevere, and I don't think that we'll stoop to the level of these zealot terrorist pigs. And we won't kill children, I hope, and mothers. But you know what? Whatever we have to do to eradicate the country or the world of this, of this vermin, I just hope Bush will do whatever is necessary to get rid of them. And I don't know what the root or what the, what the uh, answer is. All right, thank you very much. A lot of other New Yorkers here uh, continuing the evacuation from Lower Manhattan. Back to you, Aaron. Uh, thank you, Richard, very much. Uh, we told you a bit ago that the border, the U.S.-Mexican border, was at a high state of alert, had been essentially closed down, shut down. We're now told that the U.S.-Canada border is also in a high state of alert. So essentially what officials are trying to do is seal off the country. So if anyone is either trying to get in or get out, uh, it's going to be a whole lot harder to do that. Uh, but what is possible and what is imaginable, I guess, changes some on a day like this. Jerry Howard is the former head of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, here in New York, and he joins us. Um, as you look out, what do you see? Well, 
Well, this is uh, absolutely devastating. Uh, an incident like this will uh, will uh, tax every bit of resource in New York City, um, uh, particularly since so many of the uh, police officers and fire uh, firefighters on the scene were uh, injured. Um, let, let me let me. Let me stop you for a second. I want to talk specifically about what inspectors have happening, but I want to go to L.A. first. Frank Buckley is in Los Angeles with us. Frank, what can you tell us about what's going on there? Hey, Aaron, we just saw what appeared to be uh, the worst possible situation. The, the last thing that we want to show you, in fact, people arriving here at the airport, appear, apparently friends or family members of some of the uh, victims of at least one of the flights. Three flights were bound for Los Angeles, and uh, they are not arriving here obviously now friends and family are beginning beginning to trickle in we haven't seen any until this moment two people just arriving here at the airport we can tell you that just within the last uh, 15 minutes also uh, this terminal has they have begun a process of evacuating this terminal and in fact all of uh, Los Angeles uh, airport is being evacuated now we are told by uh, airport police who we just uh, spoke to uh, just a few minutes ago I'd like to, to let you hear from Lieutenant Howard Whitehead of the Los Angeles Airport Police as to the status here at uh, LAX. And because we work with other agencies who are conducting the closures outside of the airport, I can't get information right now. Three flights were bound for Los Angeles that appear to have been involved today. What accommodations are being made for the friends and family of passengers? That's being handled by the uh, airlines. Uh, they're having a meeting now concerning that, so that information you have to get from the airlines. So officially, what are you starting at this point? In we're starting uh, a total evacuation of the, of the airport. Will that include both uh, workers and passengers? Only key employees will remain at the airport. This is the entire airport that will be evacuated? Yes, ma'am. Why well, the evacuation? Because the evacuation been ordered. Uh, I can't tell you why, but that's what it's th that's our stance now. Threat to the airport? Uh, it's precautionary at this point. Have you ever seen anything like this before in Los Angeles? Not to my knowledge, no. And what is it? What is your going to be your role? The police department's role in this. What are you doing? We're protecting the public. That's that's what our job is. Will roads in and out of the airport be uh, closed as well? Will people be able to get into the airport? Um, right now, this thing is fluid. We're, we're working as as we go with the changes. So I couldn't give you a definite on anything right now. How many that's, police officers more or less thanks very much. here in the airport on a regular day? So. Uh, uh, other agencies involved, I couldn't give you the exact Right now, there are other agencies there are, Yes, ma'am. That's all I have for right now. Thank you. Time My name is Lieutenant Whitehead. So this is what you're looking that, that was Lieutenant Howard Whitehead of the LAX police telling us again that just within the last 15 or 20 minutes, an order has come down, a command decision to close to evacuate the terminals at LAX. Up until this point, of course, flights were not being allowed in or out. Now they are evacuating all the terminals except for key personnel. Also here with me now is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Al Van Cleef of the Salvation Army. You have the very difficult task of helping to coordinate the grief counseling. Can you tell me about the accommodations that are being made for family members of uh, Flight 11, 77 and 175? We have six grief counselors on site now, two of the teams ready. We're waiting word now from American Airlines. They are. Uh, diligently working on the plans as far as a private location where the family will be received. As soon as uh, we're aware of that, then they will make contact with us so our counselors can proceed to where family members will be arriving. We've done the same thing here in Los Angeles as well as San Francisco and Washington, D.C. Very difficult day for you, sir. Thanks very, very much for joining us. That is the latest from Los Angeles. Aaron Brack, back to you. Frank, thank you. Frank Buckley in Los Angeles. We are in the midst of extraordinary national tragedy attacks in Washington and New York, attacks on airliners, the dimensions of which are not yet clear. But what is clear is that this is a day unlike any other. The worst fears of officials around the country, security, intelligence, military officials, political leaders, worst fears being realized, being played out in New York and Washington, 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh where a plane went down. Uh, other planes have crashed. We don't know the circumstances precisely. We now have a report perhaps of another building here in New York that has collapsed. CNN producer Rose Arce is on the phone. Rose, what can you tell us? Yes, there's another building very close to World Trade Center that was hit by debris some time ago and it appears to be on the verge of collapse. Also, that enormous plume of smoke that you see that's surrounding the building, there are suspicions that it's not all smoke, but that there's a gas leak within that smoke. And that has caused a tremendous amount of panic in this area. 
the police have been saying that they're not evacuating all of lower Manhattan, and you can see people moving north in a flood through these streets that are just filled with ash. You know, as you walk through the ash, you can see debris from inside the World Trade Center itself, a very, very eerie scene, pieces of paper from people's desks, office supplies, many, many blocks from the site of the actual explosion where they now are fearing that there may be yet another explosion because of this, this potential gas leak. Rose, thank you. Rose Arce, who's on the streets of Manhattan. Back to Jerry Howard, who uh, helped, uh, who ran the mayor's emergency response team. And I, I'm not sure I got the title right, but the okay. essence is correct. When you all, after, after the 93 attack on the buildings, and you sat down and tried to redo a plan, which I assume happened, did you anticipate anything of this magnitude? Well, we have plans in place in New York City for for massive incidents, but an incident like this is uh, very difficult to plan for, just because of the number of people that have been in, the number of responders that have been injured. There are responders. We mean police, police fire, fire, EMS, rescue, correct. Right. Uh, there are uh, literally hundreds of people coming from New Jersey. Uh, as you heard from the governor early, the National Guard will be uh, activated to help with the uh, 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 law enforcement to help seal the area. Uh, the, uh, I, I know that FEMA will be activating their search and rescue teams uh, to assist with going through the debris. This is going to be a, uh, a long-term operation. It is going to be um, uh, a, a very difficult one because, uh, as you heard earlier, there's still a gas leak in the building, which is fueling this fire. Uh, and uh, until the gas is turned off, that, that fire could burn for some time. Stay with us, Jerry. Back to Washington, uh, CNN, Judy Woodruff. Judy, you have uh, more here. What can you tell us? Well, Aaron, uh, we are monitoring, of course, statements uh, from around the, the globe, and we've just, uh, in the last few minutes, uh, been able to get a statement from the Taliban Ambassador to Pakistan, the Taliban, of course, being a religious organization that is a party controlling the government in Afghanistan. The name Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif said in reaction to the news of these terror attacks in the United States, and I am quoting, we want to tell the American children that Afghanistan feels your pain, and we hope that the courts find justice. Now, this statement, again, made by a Taliban ambassador to Pakistan, his name, uh, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif, uh, he made it at a, st at a news conference in Islamabad. And I would just add that we're told that the, at the top of the hour, which uh, would be perhaps 1 o'clock Eastern time, we're expecting a news conference live from Kabul, Afghanistan, that is the capital of Afghanistan, the Taliban being the controlling religious party in that country, Afghanistan being the country where we have every reason to believe Osama bin Laden, the leader of a huge terrorist network, continues to live in hiding. The Taliban has denied his presence there from time to time, but it is believed by those who follow uh, the activities of, uh, of his organization that he is in Afghanistan. So we will, of course, be watching that. Let me just... All right, Aaron, I want to go back to you now in New York. Thank you, Judy. We have on the phone with us New York's Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Mr. Mayor, uh, give us your best uh, piece of information as the situation right now. The uh, situation right now is uh, uh, the massive uh, rescue effort that's going on right now. We're trying to evacuate thousands and thousands of people. We have uh, as many of our police and fire personnel as, as we have uh, down in, in the southern part of Manhattan, evacuating people, trying to save as many lives as possible. We've been in communication with Governor Pataki, who's uh, gotten the National Guard ready, and they're going to come in and relieve us a little bit later in the day. And we've spoken to the White House, and the urban search and rescue teams will come here also to assist us. But right now, it's the New York City police and fire, EMS, that are down there trying to evacuate as many people as we possibly can. And we've asked everyone to leave lower Manhattan if they can on their own so that it relieves our efforts. And this will be going on all day. It's a horrible, horrible uh, tragedy. It is that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can you tell me, uh, is it a, are, are people panicking down there? Or no, people, I, I, I was, uh, and I, I was there right under the, right under, right in the, in a building that got, hit by the by the debris when the first tower collapsed 
So I had to evacuate with with people, and we were trapped in the building for a while. And we we finally were able to get out, and uh, we all walked to uh, we all walked north. And people, everything that I observed, even though it was hundreds, maybe in some cases thousands of people that were walking out the streets, they were orderly, they were calm. They handled themselves really and, and probably better than anybody had any right to expect. And Mr. Mayor, we were told one of the problems, and Lord knows there are hundreds of problems, one of the problems was that a number, a large number of police, fire, EMS personnel have also been injured in this. Can you shed any light on that? I, 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 don't, even, I don't even want to contemplate what the number will be, but when the building collapsed, we had a lot of our police officers and firefighters in the building, and I and I know many of them because I saw some of them go in because I was there. Was it the cause the buildings to collapse, or was it the structural damage caused by the planes? I don't, I don't know. I uh, I, um, I I I saw the, the, saw the first collapse and heard the second because I was in a building when the second took place. I think it was structural, but I cannot be sure. And can you tell us how many hospitals in the city and perhaps outside the city, uh, too? Uh, All of them. Right now, right now, the last, that last count, we were utilizing over 50. I think it'll be over 100, but by the, by the, that, that, that was as of a half hour ago. And utilizing all of the hospitals in New York City. We're utilizing the hospitals in Westchester and Rockland, Nassau County, northern New Jersey. And the, 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 the main thing we have to urge people to do is to, is to be calm and evacuate lower Manhattan. And as far as the rest of the city is concerned, uh, just to go about their lives as you know, best as possible. This is a, this is a uh, I, I, I never thought I would see something like this happen. I, I, I got there after the first plane hit and before the second and watching people jump from the top of the World Trade Center. It's a, a, a uh, unbelievable sight. Mr. Mayor, my colleague Jeff Greenfield is uh, is is with us uh, also. Jeff, Mr. Mayor, in terms of well, you've already said that you want Lower Manhattan evacuated, you want everybody else to go about their business. Are there specific instructions that you want to communicate right now to yes, the, the, police, the, the, fire, everybody else? Well, police and fire are are there, and they're there in large large numbers, and they're and they are first of all trying to trying to get into the, the, the rubble and the debris to save as many people as possible. We also have thousands of police officers in Lower Manhattan, and what we want people to do is to leave Lower Manhattan, if they can, on their own. Just to walk. Sorry. To walk. I, I, I just talked to the to Dick Grasso, who runs the Stock Exchange, and we have a lot of police there. They have 3,000 people there. We're going to walk them out. We're walking them uh, east and then north, which is essentially the way I, I uh, walked out. I walked I was right below the World Trade Center when it collapsed, and then we walked up to Greenwich Village. People should walk out of Lower Manhattan, get above Canal Street, uh, for safety reasons, but for a second reason. We need people out of there so we can get thousands of ambulances in and out over the course of the next couple hours. And the fewer people we have there, the more lives we're going to be able to save. Mr. Mayor, are the subways operating? The subways are operating outside of Manhattan. Outside. Subway, outside of Manhattan, the subways are, op are operating. A couple of delays here and there, but in all five, uh, the other four boroughs, the subways are operating. In Manhattan, there are significant delays. We thought we had the Lexington Avenue open, but it is not. I'm just checking right now. The Lexington Avenue is, is, not, is not open. The A train is working, and uh, people will just have to... Just have to, you know, test and see. The best thing to do right now is to walk. The safest and best thing to do is to walk to your destination. Where schools have remained open, and we've worked with the uh, the chancellor to try to make certain that the schools will remain open for as long as they have to to help uh, parents with uh, with the kids that are that, that would be coming home. You know, starting at around one or two o'clock. Mr. Mayor, as you know better than uh, anyone, and uh, certainly New Yorkers know, but people around the country perhaps do not. This is election day here. Uh, what is the status of the election? We canceled it. The governor and I uh, decided about an hour, an hour, an hour, an hour and a half ago that uh, it made no sense to have an election today. We needed all those police officers who were at the election site, and we need to focus on on, uh, on, on rescue. So we'll, we'll find another day. We'll find another day for the election. The governor and I made that decision about an hour, an hour and a half ago. Mr. Mayor, um, you're a very focused guy in moments like this. Is it hard, given the magnitude of what's happened here and around the country, to focus on what you have to do and not just be angry? 
it's it's very hard, and it's very very hard because I know some of the people uh, in that, that are there. Their personal friends and close friends who are who, uh, in were, fact, Mr. Mayor, who, are in, who are in the building, and I haven't been able to find out if they're safe yet. The, the, your emergency command center, what some people have called a bunker, is was located. Was it not in one of the World Trade Center buildings? Uh, it was located uh, close enough to it so that it was affected by it. Not in, it's not not in one of the buildings, but it was located uh, right in that area. As as is uh, City Hall, the police department. And all of them had to be evacuated. So that, I mean, that the that that area of Manhattan. Once the uh, I I was in a building at the time that we were using as a command center, and uh, it, we were trapped in the building for a while, for about uh, 20 minutes, not able to get out. Different exits that were overcome with smoke and debris. Mr. Mayor, just as a practical question, do hospitals need help? Do they need uh, Hospitals blood? need all of the help uh, they can get. We've, we're getting a great deal of help from the surrounding areas. The governor has mobilized the state in order to make hospitals available to us outside of Manhattan. Uh, any hospital personnel or emergency personnel that want to come in and volunteer, that would be enormously helpful. But the, the best thing for us to do right now, we're trying to coordinate, is to is to move people out of the city to hospitals in surrounding areas, which we're which we're actually doing now. Uh, so far, though, our hospital system is we have a, we're very fortunate to have a gigantic hospital system. Do they have enough blood? Do they need blood? Do they need people to come sure, in and help them out? I'm sure they will. Uh, we're getting the National Guard to relieve our people by uh, early to late this afternoon. They're being mobilized now. And the three urban search and rescue teams are going to come to New York City to help us. And then anyone that wants to volunteer from surrounding areas, volunteer fire departments and others, we're working with them now to do that, to try to relieve our fire department. It's a horrific day, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there's no possible way to begin to describe it. Uh, no, there is not. To see, to see uh, what happened there, is, of course, it makes you very, very angry. Uh, it's almost impossible to describe the level of anger that you have that somebody or someone would do something like this. And Sir. all of the good and wonderful people that were affected by this, there's no there's no reason for this, there's no excuse for this. And there's uh, something like this, it's just something that you never thought you would live to see. I couldn't agree more, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. New York's Mayor Rudy Thank Giuliani. On what was to be an election day, the mayor, not up for re-election because of term limits, but the election has been postponed. Jeff, I just... Uh, Step back for a second. Well, let's you know, you talk about anger. Sorry. And we stand up here and we look at this and we've all listened to what's been going on now as we've been on the air for three hours or so. And there was a woman that Richard Roth interviewed about a half hour ago who said what I suspect that most Americans are feeling right now and some would like to say and can't, uh, how angry she was, how cowardly this all seemed to her. Uh, quickly, we go back to Washington and Judy Woodruff. Judy? Aaron, uh, government sources telling CNN that President Bush, who had been uh, in Florida for a two-day trip and who broke that trip off this morning to head back to Washington, will now not return to Washington. Repeating, President Bush will not return to Washington. We do not know where the president uh, will land or whether uh, where his aircraft will go, uh, Air Force One, but we just uh, are passing along this information just as soon as we have it. Uh, again, uh, we, as we were talking to former NATO uh, head uh, Wesley Clark, General Wesley Clark, a little while ago, he pointed out that there are contingency plans uh, that the military and the security people have for the president in a situation like this, and we're not going to do any speculating right here about where the president might be going. Joining us now on the telephone uh, we want to, and there is some information we want to share with you about aircraft in the sky uh, that is, uh, we're told, is safe right now. We're told by the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, they're telling us 50 aircraft are safely in the sky right now, all within about 50 miles of their destination. Uh, but in the meantime, we want to talk to uh, Utah Republican Senator Orrin Hatch, who's joining us on the telephones. Senator Hatch, are you there? Yes, I am. And I know my colleague, Wolf Blitzer, who's here with me in the studio in Washington, had also talked with you. Senator, you've been briefed by what uh, authorities? Well, I'm on both the Judiciary Committee and also the Intelligence Committee, and I've been briefed by the highest levels of the FBI and of the uh, 
and of the intelligence community. And I just have to say our thoughts and prayers go out to the victims of this terrible tragedy caused by a bunch of cowards. And there's no justification for what these cowards have done to purely innocent Americans, but I, I do have some information. So, Senator Hess, this, this is Wolf Blitzer. Uh, tell us, uh, I spoke with you earlier on the telephone, but tell us precisely what you are now being told in these high-level briefings about those who may, and repeat the word, may have been responsible for keep, these attacks. It, it, you're right. They've come to the conclusion that this looks like the signature of Osama bin Laden and that he may be the one behind this. I think most uh, authorities agree that uh, it's, it's, this is something that we doubt seriously if Iran, Iraq, or, or Libya would try and do, because they know of the massive response that we'd have to uh, bring down on them. But uh, there was no advance notice at all. They had no way of knowing that this was going to happen. It was carefully planned. And what it means is, and it seems to me, that if that turns out to be true, we're going to have to revitalize... Uh, Shah Massoud and the other people in Afghanistan who basically are fighting uh, t to get rid of this type of uh, terrorism. And I think we're going to have to our, ask our friends in Pakistan to get uh, uh, in turn to, uh, to uh, be more cooperative than they have in, in the past. And then we'd have to work with our allies uh, to have an international strategy to combat this type of international jihad against the West. We're listening to uh, Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah. Uh, we also have joining us on the telephone Senator John McCain uh, from his home in Arizona. Uh, Senator McCain, I assume you've been talking to uh, authorities as well. Uh, yes, Judy, and I am. Uh, I'm on Capitol Hill in Washington. Oh, I'm sorry. Way. Yeah, no problem. Thanks yes, for clarifying. And, uh, yes, yes. Um, the uh, situation uh, is so serious that words don't describe it. Um, I think that it's clear that the organization and magnitude of the attacks required more than a few people to per perpetrate it, and uh, it'll take some time to determine who they are and who supported these attacks, but I think we'll find them out, and they will suffer the full measure of our justice. This is, uh, this is obviously an act of war that's been committed on the United States of America. What do you mean, obviously, an act of war, Senator McCain? These uh, uh, attacks uh, clearly constitute uh, an act of war, the unwarranted, unprovoked attacks against innocent uh, American citizens uh, is clearly an act of war and one that uh, requires that kind of national response and international response. Uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, I believe, is, is also still with us, uh, Senator. And Senator Hatch, you you mentioned the bin Laden organization. Uh, former NATO head uh, General Wesley Clark also said to us about an hour ago uh, in an interview that he believes that it's only the bin Laden organization that is capable of carrying out attacks this coordinated and on this massive a scale. What are you basing your information on? Well, keep in mind, there, there are nations that, that also could carry out these attacks, but they, I don't think, would dare do that, knowing that uh, their signature is going to be figured out. We're going to find out who did this, and we're going after the bastards. It's that simple. And, and uh, I, I just have to say that uh, both the FBI and our intelligence community believe that this is a bin Laden signature. And, uh, and I believe it is. I, I was the first to point out bin Laden to the... Uh, Clinton administration and said they're going to kill Americans and we've got to get on top of that. And I think we're well, going to have to get on top of it because this uh, this is a cowardly bunch who will stop at nothing to, uh, like you say, uh, have a jihad or a war against the United States and, and to do it in the most cowardly fashion. But, but Senator McCain, I mean, there will be those who are saying the United States was taking all reasonable precautions. We had security at airports, metal detectors, uh -huh. and so forth and so on. How much more is going to have to be done to prevent something like these things from happening again? Judy, I don't think our lifestyles will be the same for a long time uh, for, uh, since uh, it was before these attacks as far as uh, use of transportation, particularly airports, are concerned. Uh, you know, there have been warnings about uh, whether our security was good enough and, and whether the proper measures were being taken. I'm sure that will all be uh, reviewed. And by the way, I have no information as to who uh, who caused this, um, and I hesitate to speculate, but I am confident that the President of the United States will lead us, and, and we will find out who has carried out these acts. And I think it's a little premature to uh, 
to, to deter, make that determination until we have the hard facts, but I'm sure that we'll get them. The other aspect of this is that uh, it may highlight over time the need for more human intelligence. We have very good technical intelligence capabilities, satellites, etc. but we, oh, for many years we haven't had the kind of human intelligence which determines motivations before actions are taken. I'm going to... I'm going to interrupt you, Senator McCain. These are the first pictures we have in. Uh, this is from Somerset County, Pennsylvania. This is where the United Airlines flight, I believe it is 176, went down. I'm sorry, I, I'm correcting. United Airlines 93. This was a Boeing 757 bound from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco. It crashed in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, near the town of Shanksville. South of Pittsburgh, we're told about 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh in right. western Pennsylvania. It is not known how many passengers or crew were on board, although initial reports indicated uh, no survivors. Again, these are the first pictures we have coming in from WTAJ there in the Pittsburgh area. United Airlines telling us earlier they had lost... Uh, they have lost this flight, and they knew that it had crashed near Pittsburgh. There is a second United Airlines flight, the Boeing 767, Flight 175, bound from Boston to Los Angeles, has crashed. The airline's still telling us at this point that they do not know where. We don't have information on the number of people aboard. It is possible, it is possible, but not confirmed, that this would have been the second plane to hit the World Trade Center. Now again, two United Airlines flights, and in addition to American Airlines flights, uh, the flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles, this was a Boeing 767 with 81 passengers on board, nine crew members, two pilots. This is believed to, be, to be one of the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center. All four of these planes that we're describing to you now, these flights, all headed to California. The second American Airlines Flight 77, this is a Boeing 757, left Dulles Airport near Washington on its way to Los Angeles. It had 58 passengers on board, four crew, two pilots. This plane unaccounted for. However, a commercial jet was seen crashing into the Pentagon a few hours ago, and it is believed that this could have been the one, but again, not confirmed. So two commercial airliners, American Airliners, American Airlines, two United Airlines. And I would just add at this point, because to be reassuring to some extent to those of you who are watching, we've been reporting that all flights within the United States have been canceled. There's been a complete hold down on all commercial travel. However, there were planes that were already in the air when these terrible uh, incidents took place this morning. And as of a few moments ago, the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, was reporting that there were still 50 aircraft in the skies. Now, some of those may have landed in the last few minutes, but that was the information as of a few minutes ago. All of them were said to be within 50 or so miles of their destination. Now, I'm getting new information in my ear. Now, Reporting uh, our, our congressional correspondent, Kate Snow, you're looking at a picture of the Pentagon Live. There's still smoke billowing out of our military command center in the United States. As we look at these pictures, I'm going to turn it over right now to our congressional correspondent, Kate Snow, who has with her two members of Congress. Kate. Judy, it's been a bit difficult to get in touch with members of Congress. Uh, as we've been reporting, the Capitol has been shut down. You can see it behind me here. You can see that everything's fine there but it is in a state of lockdown. They've evacuated the Capitol. Joining me here on the roof of a church, I might add, we've managed to get up on the roof here to get a vantage point, is Congressman Kurt Weldon, a Republican from Pennsylvania around the Philadelphia area, not exactly where that video that we just saw, uh, the other end of the state, and also Congressman Ed Schrock uh, from Virginia Beach, from the Virginia the state of Virginia, also a Republican. You both serve on the Armed Services Committee. In fact, you were in the middle of a briefing. Uh, you were about to talk to reporters about the need for more money for our military. Let me start with you, Congressman Weldon. You, you've been talking to me up here. You've been expressing outrage at all of this. You've been saying this is a failure of the U.S. intelligence system. It's a failure of our intelligence system. I asked the sergeant in arms of the Capitol just 45 minutes ago in a meeting with 70 senators and House members, how much advance notice did you have? 
He said none. There was no intelligence. Our FBI and our CIA are there to intercept raw data. This is a massive operation, and it's a failure that was caused by a lack of resources and by a complacency that set in America over the past 10 years, a complacency that convinced all of us that with the demise of the Soviet Union, there were no more threats. It's a tragedy that it took the loss of thousands of lives to wake this country up and realize that our number one responsibility is not education and I'm a teacher, and it's not health care, I'm married to a nurse. It is in fact the security and the safety of the American people. And today, our government failed the American people. Congressman Schrock, how much information have you as a member of Congress been able to get? I know that the members have been milling around here trying to get yeah. information. Have you been able to get information? Not a whole lot. The most, most information we got was when we went to the U.S. Capitol Police headquarters and they, tried, they were piecing together uh, what had happened and trying to feed us as they got that. But nothing substantive. It seems like there's no game plan in, in do, operation. Do the two of you know why you were evacuated from the U.S. Capitol? Absolutely. I uh, talked to Bill Levingo, the Sergeant Arms, in the Capitol, and he said, Kurt, we've been uh, told that a plan is taken off from Reagan, and we think it may be heading toward the Capitol. I mean, they hit our economic center, the World Trade Center. They hit, hit our Pentagon. They hit our State Department. So the obvious next item you'd like to hit is the U.S. Capitol and perhaps the Supreme Court. And obviously those are unconfirmed reports that That's any right. plane, but there were rumors here That's for right. a good two hours right. that there were potentially planes headed this right. direction. Now we're in we total lockdown, as you said, and members are basically scattered around the city. But we're going to get back to work because we're going to convince these cowards that America doesn't back down, that our government will continue to operate in you spite of these terrorist activities. You said activities. we're at war. We're at war. We're absolutely at war. This is 21st century war. These are the kinds of activities that we expect need, from cowards and terrorist groups. I need to go back to Judy Woodruff now in Washington. Judy. All right, Kate, uh, thank you. And I want to tell our viewers that we do know now that President Bush has landed uh, in sh near Shreveport, Louisiana, at Barksdale Air Force Base. We're told that he is talking to reporters. There may be a statement from the president uh, from the White House there on the ground. And uh, one other item here from Washington before I turn it back over to Aaron Brown in New York. Uh, 34 Pentagon victims at least being treated at three Washington hospitals. No word on fatalities. Aaron. Judy. Uh in the area, I guess, of practical information, and we talked to the mayor about this a little bit ago, there is now in New York and in northern New Jersey a critical shortage of blood, a desperate need for blood. We would remind people that giving blood is perfectly safe and on a day like today, absolutely necessary. And so if that's something you can do to help out in the midst of this extraordinary tragedy, uh, you might consider doing that. On the phone with us, James Sanders, who's uh, with Bellevue Hospital, one of the major hospitals here in New York. Mr. Sanders, what can you tell us about the situation there? Uh, hi, it's Hillary Lane reporting. Now, Mr. Sanders was called back into the command center, but I can fill you in on the briefing that he just gave us. This is the largest emergency and trauma unit in New York City and the second largest emergency unit in the country. Uh, they say they are underutilized right now while the hospitals downtown closer to the Trade Center are absolutely overwhelmed. So they have put out a call to EMS saying, bring people in here. It is an emergency call. What I have seen at this point are some patients staggering and being helped in nobody in apparently critical condition. The hospital tells us that they've had 65 minor injuries. Those are broken bones, internal injuries, smoke inhalation cases. There have been okay. 10 days. Hillary, Hillary, I need to interrupt you. One person brought in. Hillary, I need to interrupt you. This is a Taliban spokesman uh, talking uh, now in Kabul, I believe. This is coming to us uh, by video phone from Afghanistan. And I am not hearing him. Perhaps you guys are, but I am not hearing him. You should remind our viewers yeah, that yeah, Afghanistan was one of the sites I that was hit yeah, three yeah. years ago uh, by the United States. Uh, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan have, has already explicitly uh, said its uh, standpoint or its position about terrorism. The terrorism tool and war of the Uluna, the Katunis of Afghanistan, Kiham, the Urani Pishkiri, the Ultimulamisha, the terrorism, Shkar Sivu, the Tomogandari of the Rivals of Tomogandari. 
the deal on Bitcoin. Uh, we have criticized uh, all forms of criticism as Afghanistan has itself faced and has become the victim of uh, uh, terrorism, and we you are now criticizing the kind of act. Terrorism, you are on the direction of the occupation of the Terrorism is a uh, uh, terrifying uh, and uh, hateful uh, hatred or hateful message. Oh, uh, the that is the the Bashari, hello, para, para, or Lena Orinde. And this incident uh, is uh, from the humanitarian point of view, surely a very vast and very terrifying uh, incident. Any question? Any question? Question is, uh, have you received any kind of information or any kind of uh, communication from the United States or any other explanation? Oh, the, um, the 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 um, uh, no contact up to now, they might be busy or they surely they are busy in the rescue operation. So they need con condolence, but up to now, no communication from him. Does the Taliban categorically condemn these attacks on the United States? Taliban, the Mahalawar, the Taliban, the Taliban. Our policy was very clear from the very beginning, and we have criticized, and even now we criticize terrorism in all its forms. Can you rule out any involvement by Osama bin Laden? Osama bin Laden, last year, six hundred years. Uh, no, after now, no one has blamed or accused him for money. The Taliban have said that they will maintain Mr. Bin Laden without communication, unable to communicate. Can you be convinced at this time that your policy of keeping him without communication has been, has been effective in recent months? Taliban uh, Romana Kalichu Saman is Latin to Sarabahak in the East, Salati, in Canada, in the Latin. Taki the Havar Kay, which was from Arapalis, and I did it. No change in our policy in the Do you think the policy is working? How the policy car hunky? And decisions obviously turn to Osama bin Laden, and the media has been mentioned as possibly having a hand in this. Are you concerned that Afghanistan could be on the receiving end of recrimination to the uh, I think that even if someone has taken his name in the media, it might be just because uh, uh, he was, uh, his name was repeatedly mentioned in the past in the comments. Just for this reason, the name might help you repeat it. So just the second half of the question, though. Are you concerned that Afghanistan could receive this kind of attack? Uh, no, we are not concerned about that. We don't see or foresee any difficulty in this regard because there is no argument or no reason for it. If it were to happen, if there were to be attacks, what would the implication be of such a situation? If there were attacks from... As Jonathan said, if there were to be reprisals against Afghanistan, what would the implications of that be 
Přičem to byla si hluky kousy a co nám má a si bylo a vybrací. Uh, it is a little bit earlier to say at this stage, but as we said that we criticize all forms all forms of criticism. So if a Pakistan uh, is attacked, then we can uh, call it uh, state terrorism. It's also uh, has also been concerns expressed about Arab mercenary fighters in Afghanistan and Arab allegations allegations that there's maybe an Arab connection. Can you talk to those concerns? Can you rule out any Arab link? Uh, one of the Arab links is one of the Arab links. Can you talk to those concerns? 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 Can you talk uh, it is a very big and uh, enormous uh, incident, so just to connect it uh, with uh, some people that even uh, one logic cannot even accept it, so in my opinion, it, will, it might not be a justifying. Mr. are you surprised that the United States has received this sort of attack? Uh, then because this might be uh, the only and the unique kind of incident in the history of the United States. So the second one here is also the Taliban official in Kabul. The relevance here, of course, is that the United States government has blamed the Afghani government for harboring Osama bin Laden, who may or may not be responsible for the events that have happened here in the country today, and therefore the Taliban response. The president, uh, who was in Sarasota, Florida, when President Bush, when uh, the first attack on the Trade Center took place, issued a statement then. He left Sarasota. He is not going back to the White House, at least not yet, but he has told reporters, quote, we have taken all appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Make no mistake, said the President, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. The President said the U.S. military has been put on a high alert status and said he had taken security precautions to ensure the government continues to function. And as we said, the President at this moment is... Uh, not going back to Washington. He has been taken elsewhere for his own safety. There's no reason, by the way, at this point to believe there are continuing threats, but that doesn't mean there aren't any, and the Secret Service is taking no chances, and we can't recall anything even approaching that. Uh, we also have a report coming out of London from the Associated Press that followers of Osama bin Laden had warned three weeks ago that they would carry out a huge an unprecedented attack on U.S. interests. That, according to a London-based Arab journalist, he adds, they said it would be huge and unprecedented, but did not specify what it was. And we will not assume that this is what it was. But obviously, a lot of people are wondering. Joining us on the phone, Richard Holbrook, former uh, American ambassador to the United Nations, Robert Gates, former head of the CIA, and they join us. Mr. Gates, let me start with you, because I suspect I suspect that millions of Americans right now are asking, how could something like this happen? How could it happen? I think we have to start by acknowledging that we've been both fortunate and the first major attack like this is, that has been planned several years ago. There was a plot to bring down 11 American jumbo jets in Asia that the FBI and U.S. intelligence supported, and there have been uh, some other major attacks. So I think that 
uh, when you have a, a free and open country as we do, we are we are vulnerable to this sort of thing, and it, it is the face of this term that people have been talking about for several years of asymmetric warfare, and it is and it is a way of getting at us, the most powerful military nation in the world, in ways in which we're vulnerable. Sir, we heard, and, and perhaps it's given our proximity to the events, it's a little bit unseemly, but we heard a member of Congress not uh, but a few minutes ago essentially say that the American government failed its people. Is it fair to say that this is a failure, or are we just can't we can't know it all. Well, personally, I believe that uh, for people to start uh, blaming people and organizations at this point uh, uh, is highly premature. I think that we need to find out just exactly how bad this situation is and deal with it. Uh, the idea of starting to cast blame uh, within hours of something having happened is, is in fact, unseemly. And Ambassador Holbrook, does the United States in a situation like this go it alone, or does it gather the international community together as one or as much of one as it can and try and respond in that form? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, at this moment, we have to find out what happened down there. I used to work in that building and uh, was there when, the, uh, when it was attacked a few years ago. Uh, I know that area. My assistant has a cousin who's now missing in the building. And my thoughts are first for the enormous, unbelievable loss of life and tragedy that's going on in Lower Manhattan. Uh, beyond that, Aaron, on your question, this requires a unified international response by all the key member states of the world community, including very importantly Russia. And as for the interview you just broadcast by the foreign minister from the Taliban, let's be clear on his attempts to disassociate himself from Osama bin Laden. We don't know at this point who did this, but it was well coordinated and done with a degree of skill which exceeds anything. I think Bob Gates will know better than me, but I think, Bob, this is the most uh, skillful, uh, a murderous attack ever have in terms of coordination. And I want to be very clear on this. Bin Laden himself, as you just suggested, Bin Laden has said that the Taliban leader, Mullah Mohammed Omar, is the true spiritual leader of the Muslim world. He said that Afghanistan is the purified Islamic state equivalent to Mecca and Medina. And in a tape that the New York Times wrote about two days ago, he urged Muslims everywhere, and I'm quoting the New York Times, to migrate to Afghanistan to support the Taliban, saying it's their duty to God, and saying there's now finally a Muslim state that destroys falsehoods and does not succumb to the American infidel and is led by the a true believer, Mullah Mohammed Omar, and so on and so forth. So what I want to stress here is that any nation, and this goes for the Taliban and their uh, henchmen in Afghanistan, any nation in the world that harbored anyone associated with this must be treated as though they were part of what is effectively an act of war against the United States. And uh, they cannot hide behind the uh, traditional defi definitions of difficulty. In the past, we've tried to get Osama bin Laden. He's evaded capture. He almost got killed by a bombing raid two or three years ago. And uh, I think starting with Afghanistan, we're going to have to hold everyone, everyone accountable uh, on the uh, who might have sheltered anyone associated with this act. So we, we don't simply in this conversation. We don't simply hold the group itself, whoever it is, the group itself accountable. We hold anyone accountable, any country, any government accountable uh, if they did nothing to stop it. Any country which shelters, obeys, or, or helps these people and their cohorts evade, capture, and the retribution they deserve is, in my view, functionally uh, culpable of the events that took place in New York and Washington and elsewhere today and must be so warned. 
Uh, I'm not accusing the Taliban specifically at this point because we don't know who did it. Correct. But all the evidence points to a connection between Os Osama bin Laden and Taliban leaders and a, an attempt on the Taliban's part to, as the New York Times put it, two days before this attack, call it a, as a, a ploy. And that is a quote from the New York Times before this happened. So I just want to underscore again, we are going to need the support of all our allies in Europe, the Russians, the Chinese, and any other country that might have in the past flirted with uh, playing both sides of the street. Uh, nothing like this has happened in American history. The full dimensions of it are still not clear to anyone, but I think we all can imagine it's going to be a heart-wrenching in its, in its dimensions as it becomes fully apparent. And we're not going to be able to uh, leave it, uh, leave countries playing two sides here. And I'm sure my friend Bob Gates would uh, not disagree with that. Let me, uh, uh, Mr. Gates, I want to come back to you. Mr. Holbrook, stay with us for a minute. Uh, I believe now uh, we have the president. This is the president on tape a few moments ago. Obviously, obviously, we're having a, a technical problem. Let me just tell you what, again, the president said in what has been his second statement. His first statement came after uh, the first attacks here in New York. A short time ago, the president said, we have taken all appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. He added, we make no mistakes that the president of the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible uh, I think we're going to try and hear the president again. Here we go. Yeah. This, is, uh, this is coming to us from the broadcast pool. It's traveling with the president. Uh, obviously, we're getting... It's a very chaotic day, as you can imagine. A, a horrible tragedy has taken place, and people are working very hard to get stuff done and get it done right, and obviously the pool was having trouble feeding the tape. But again, uh, the president said, make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Cowardly acts, I think it's fair to say we don't quite have our arms around the, 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 the magnitude of it all. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status. And we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me and saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. President Bush, a short time ago, in his second remarks of the day, the president initially was headed back to the White House, and a decision was made, a security decision was made to divert the flight.
And so the president will not go back to Washington, at least not yet. When he, when he will return, perhaps John King can tell us. Our senior White House correspondent joins us now. John? Johnny there? Yes, I am, Aaron. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. I hear you fine. Uh, do you have any word on when the president will come back? No, we do not. As you reported, we were told earlier in the day the number one priority was the president's safety. The number two priority was to get him back to the White House because they believe that would send a powerful political statement. But as the president was on his way back from Florida, we were told by sources a security decision was made that at this time not to bring him back to Washington. So he was brought, and we won't disclose his exact location for security reasons, he was brought to one of several military installations in the United States that is equipped, we are told, with a very sophisticated command and control bar bunker, very much like the equipment that would be available to the president here at the White House in the White House Situation Room. We are also told that national security team members are still in the White House Situation Room, and earlier today, at least as of a little more than an hour ago, Vice President Cheney as well, um, directing operations and monitoring things from there. But the president obviously deciding not to come directly back to Washington. We are told that is for security reasons, delivering the statement you just heard. He has been in touch with congressional leaders, and we are told leadership members of the U.S. Congress are also being taken to an undisclosed location for their security. So we're trying to get more information on that, and we'll bring that to you as soon as we have it. Aaron Lines. John, thanks. Senior White House correspondent John King. To, uh, Peter Bergen, uh, CNN's Peter Bergen, has been tracking uh, the government of Afghanistan for some time, and he was listening in a few moments ago when the Taliban spokesman was speaking. Uh, Peter, first of all, what did you hear? Was there anything that perhaps the, the, the rest of us might not have heard any nuance uh, in what you heard? Why don't you start there? Well, we just heard from the foreign minister, Wakil uh, Mujawakil, who's <clears throat> relatively speaking a moderate of the Taliban movement. He basically repeated what I think is a standard Taliban line we've heard for the past at least couple of years, which is that Osama bin Laden isn't a terrorist and that he's being contained by the Taliban and that he's not able to uh, conduct political or military missions. Um, this, unfortunately, is really a, a false statement uh, since Osama bin Laden has been uh, fingered by both Yemeni and U.S. authorities for the bombing of the USS Cole in Yemen uh, in October 2000. Uh, there isn't an indictment there yet. The FBI continues to investigate, but uh, senior Yemeni officials and senior U.S. officials have said that he's the primary suspect. So uh, we've seen that bin Laden uh, was able to bomb two U.S. embassies in Africa in 98 within nine minutes of each other. We've seen that bin Laden was able to blow a huge hole in the side of one of the most sophisticated warships in the U.S. In the US Navy, the USS Cole in Yemen in October of last year. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he must be top of the list of uh, the person sophisticated enough in terms of operations uh, to bring off these kinds of uh, terrible disasters we've seen today. Um, if, uh, if you're looking for who is the most likely suspect, he has to be it. You've got an operation in which uh, several people appear to commit suicide. You've also got an operation in which people uh, uh, obviously had some skill in piloting planes. These are uh, clearly attributes of his organization. We know that he has pilots in his organization. We've seen several in several instances that his members of his organization commit suicide in attacks. Uh, we've also seen a pattern of warnings in previous bin Laden attacks in which this fits. Uh, nine weeks before the U.S. Embassy bombings in Africa in August of 98, bin Laden held a press conference in Afghanistan talking about, quote, good news in coming weeks. Uh, a few months before the USS Cole was bombed in Yemen, a videotape uh, circulated around the Middle East in which bin Laden uh, uh, was wearing a Yemeni dagger, which he's never done in previous photographs, and uh, one of his... Uh, 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 his number two uh, called for attacks on U.S. Uh, targets in Yemen. Uh, just recently, there's been a videotape floating around the Middle East in which uh, bin Laden, a very confident bin Laden, calls for attacks on the United States, uh, says that the victory of Yemen, referring to the USS Cole attack, will continue. Uh, people that I've talked to are familiar with the bin Laden organization said that the threats on this tape were very serious. Uh, that there was an imminent attack in the works. I, I spoke to somebody who was uh, familiar with the organization a, a few weeks ago who made those statements to me. I had been very concerned about a potential attack as a result of this tape. Uh, it fits with the modus operandi, which is to talk, talk about potential attacks coming up uh, relatively soon without being particularly specific. Here, let, let me just interrupt you for a second. Uh, our senior analyst, Jeff Greenfield, is here, and uh, Jeff has a question. Jeff, go ahead. Hi, Peter. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you actually interviewed Osama bin Laden some years ago, correct? 
Yeah, in 97. For right. CNN. Now, at that time, uh, what did he say about the, the, the notion of targeting civilians? I mean, what, what is the rationale behind targeting civilians for death and destruction? Well, at that time, Jeff, uh, he told us that because of the American military presence in the Middle East, that uh, he was calling for attacks on U.S. soldiers. Uh, now, he said if American civilians got in the way, that was sort of their problem. Uh, so at that time in 97, he was really only calling for attacks on American uh, military targets. And later, that uh, position evolved. Like by 98, he was calling for attacks on all Americans, whether civilian or military. I think the rationale behind that thinking is that, uh, in his view, if you're an American taxpayer, you're subsidizing um, the anti-Islamic, uh, quote, activities that, uh, that he's against, whether that's in Saudi Arabia, uh, with the American military presence there, or with America's support for Israel and in the, in the ongoing uh, intifada. Jeff. Peter, thank you for your work today. I suspect we'll get back to you, uh, but we appreciate the, the background, which I think gives us some context for why the focus is again on Bin Laden. Uh, but we should add that as we talk to you now, we can't be certain. We do not know that that's who is behind what has happened. What we do know is an extraordinary national tragedy has taken place, that someone is responsible, that the American government has promised to hunt down and punish, the president's words a short time ago, hunt down and punish whoever is responsible. Do we have Director Gates still on the phone? No, we, I, I don't believe Yes, we do not. Uh, because the question, obviously, we've already heard it with Sir General Clark and at least one of the congressmen asking the question, how can an agency with an estimated budget of $26.5 billion a year not have known this? I think that's the first of many such questions we're going to be hearing. Sandy Berger, who worked national security in the Clinton administration, and Richard Holbrook, the former U.N. ambassador, back on the phone uh, with us. Uh, Mr. Berger, give me a sense of what is going on in Washington right now. What who are the players at the table, where is the table, and what are they doing? Well, uh, obviously the President of the United States is uh, uh, at the head of the table no matter where he is. Um, but uh, um, uh, uh, others around that table include the Secretary of Defense and Attorney General, uh, head of the FBI, the National Security Advisor, it's, uh, Secretary of State, because uh, this may obviously involve uh, uh, international uh, 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 matters. I think. I think we, in the midst of our outrage and uh, indignation, we have to stay focused and uh, stay determined. Here, the first job in this situation is rescue and and to deal with what must be thousands of people here who are uh, uh, in peril. This is, in the first instance, a massive uh, rescue operation. In the second instance, it's a security operation. We don't know uh, what else uh, may be part of this multifaceted uh, operation. Uh, a number of precautions have been taken in the last few hours, uh, and we have to uh, obviously lock down as much as we can. Uh, and then the focus becomes uh, detection, and I think that Given the magnitude of this, given the fact that uh, this has obviously involved multiple uh, points of, uh, uh, of origin uh, in the United States, uh, it is inconceivable to me that we will not uh, know uh, uh, relatively uh, quickly when the dust uh, settles uh, who is responsible for this. Now, Mr. Holbrook, Ambassador Holbrook, what has happened today is a is extraordinary. Give it give it a kind of historical context. The enormity of what's taken place. Well, I think your coverage has made it more clear than anything else. Although, despite the superb efforts you've made, it hasn't yet become fully evident to your viewers what would be evident to any of us, like myself, who worked in the World Trade Center. I was there in the last bombing, as I mentioned earlier. That uh, the number of people in that area, including the Chambers Street subway stop, which goes right under the World Trade Center, uh, means that the dimensions of it exceed by a factor of it, probably a hundred any previous uh, incident, including Oklahoma City and the previous World Trade Center in American history. 
and one must be ready for news that will be very, very grim indeed for all of us as individuals who will have friends and relatives there and for all Americans. And there will be uh, additional consequences. This is the financial center of the world. Uh, the uh, buildings in that area, all of which have now been evacuated, whose infrastructures may be threatened by gas and uh, electrical line degradation, uh, could affect, at least temporarily, uh, the financial markets as well, although I would leave that to Treasury and Sandy Berger listed the people at the table. I'm not sure if Sandy mentioned the Treasury Secretary, but I'm sure the Treasury and the Fed are well aware of the implications of orderly movement and capital transfers. Now, looking beyond that, Aaron, I, I think we have to go back to the fact that everyone has talked about the possibility of this kind of thing for a long time, and we faced lesser uh, but similar attempts. Uh, this exceeded, apparently, the expectations of the intelligence experts, and uh, we will learn more about that in the weeks to come. But I need to underscore one point. To find the people responsible is going to take a unified international effort. No one nation, not even the United States, can do it on its own. And we must have the full cooperation of the Russians, of the states in the Middle East. So I think the assumption that that's the region where this was planned is pretty solid. And, and I repeat this again, any nation that is seen to have harbored or abetted or sheltered any of these people must be treated as co-equally responsible. They cannot hide behind the facade we just saw in the remarks of the Taliban foreign minister. And Peter Bergen's uh, extraordinarily insightful explanation a few minutes ago on C CNN, I think, is the first real glimpse into that, that the viewers have had into how dangerous this is. If the Taliban shelters Osama bin Laden, as they do, and if Osama bin Laden is responsible for this, as I think almost everyone is going to suspect, then the Taliban must be held equally responsible for what has happened today. Jeff, and Ambassador Holbrook, what can, I'm, I'm, I would like you to be specific. What does that mean? Are you talking about a retaliatory strike? Is against Jeff? Afghanistan? Yeah, that's Jeff. It's Jeff Greenfield. I'm sorry. I'm Hi, Jeff. No. Is that what you mean? That if 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 put the put the links together. No, I, let me be, Jeff. Let me be. Let me be very frank. And I, I don't want to. I don't want to lapse into uh, bloody-minded uh, verbal excesses at a moment of high emotion. But let's be very blunt about this. If a country or regime, the Taliban or some other regime to be determined by the intelligence community has sheltered people who played a role in this. They cannot hide behind the uh, attributes of they didn't know it, they had nothing to do with it. They must cooperate in the pursuit of the people responsible. And since the Taliban, a leader, has been publicly proclaimed by Osama bin Laden as the uh, as the present spiritual leader of the Muslim world, I'm referring to bin Laden's the declaration that Mullah Muhammad Omar is the rightful leader of the spiritual leader of the Muslim world, something he said on tape, quoted by John Burns in the New York Times two days ago. And uh, if, in fact, these people are in some degree of collusion, I personally believe, and I'm only speaking for myself here, I personally believe that the Taliban should be uh, regarded as co-equally responsible for this, and therefore, if and when we consider military action, it, sh it is fully justified, and uh, and the Taliban should face the same consequences. Uh, Ambassador, thank you. Just uh, quickly, if we can, one uh, last question to Sandy Berger. When when you were at the table. In, in honesty, did you ever anticipate the magnitude, an attack of this magnitude, which has taken place just to remind people, not just in this city, in New York, not just in the capital, Washington, but on a number of airliners flying across the country as well. Was the planning that broad, with the fear that great? Well, I think uh, uh, for, for some time, uh, uh, 
we have known uh, that we are uh, uh, vulnerable to a, a, a serious attack, uh, a multiple attack was thwarted, as you recall, during the Millennium New Year. Um, but I think this, you know, certainly exceeds uh, in scope um, anything that the uh, intelligence community anticipated um, and uh, uh, is, a, as I said, an extraordinarily sophisticated operation uh, to carry out something like this from, from various sites in the United States relatively simultaneously without detection. Uh, and uh, uh, whoever has uh, has perpetrated this has has declared war on the United States, uh, and uh, uh, we 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 will have to respond uh, uh, accordingly. But I would I would also caution here that we should we should be careful about jumping to uh, certitude uh, about what happened here. We'll know this soon enough. Uh, and we'll also know, uh, be able to find out why uh, we, this was not detected. I think that's, that's just a, an extraordinarily important point, that, that what is going on right now at this moment is more important the need for blood. Uh, are you sending, setting up shelters for people? Sure. We have, we have shelters um, both in New York City and in um, Washington, D.C. that are set up to help people. Um, there we have disaster mental health counselors that are, that are able to, to meet with people and to uh, register people uh, as they come in and uh, are trying to, to get away from the situation. Uh, we are set up in New York at Penn Station, at Grand Central Station, and in Washington, D.C., at Fort Belvere. Um, it is still chaos right now. We are in the process of ramping up our operations. While we did respond immediately, there's so much work to be done, and we're in the process of doing that right now. We have about 50,000 units of, uh, of blood that are available for the affected areas, and the American Red Cross is looking at mobilizing that right now and putting that into place. And uh, Phil, as you were speaking, we were able to put up on the screen numbers that people can call uh, if they can help. Um, if you're sitting in Omaha, Nebraska today, is it helpful in this situation to be going to the, to the blood bank and giving blood, or is it too far away to be meaningful? The message that the American Red Cross is putting out right now is to donate blood. Call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-E or visit redcross.org for more information. But uh, giving blood is where the art emphasis is right now. No matter where you are in the country. Yes, well, no matter where you are in the country, or you can you know, contact your local hospital if you're not in a Red Cross area, but 1-800-GIVE-LIFE is the best number to call. Okay, so even if you are far away from the events of today, uh, you can still be helpful, uh, as there is certainly in New York and in Washington, from what Judy said, a serious shortage of blood. Uh, the American Red Cross can be helpful. Your local hospital, your local blood bank uh, can be helpful. We suspect before the day is out, uh, fire stations around the country will be involved in these efforts as well. Uh, Phil, thank you. Is there anything else, by the way, before I let you go, that you want to say uh, that would be helpful to our viewers or helpful to the Red Cross? Well, the Red Cross right now and our, our president, Dr. Bernadine Healy, extend our heartfelt sor sorrows to all families and everyone that's been affected by this. Um, we just urge people to donate blood. Uh, thank you very much, Phil, with the American Red Cross. Phil Zapetta with the American Red Cross. Uh, CNN's Miles O'Brien has been tracking the flight paths of these four planes that were involved. Uh, Miles, are you able to hear me in Atlanta? Yes, I am, Aaron. And tell me what you've been able to figure out to this point. Well, as you probably know, Aaron, there are various commercial websites that allow you to track commercial aircraft. Now, if you go to many of them right now, you're not going to get very far because they're being overwhelmed by interest in people. Uh, but even if you could get some of the data, we have just learned from the Federal Aviation Administration that every domestic airliner that was in the air is now on the ground. This is unprecedented in aviation history in this country. There's not a plane flying right now. At any given moment, typically there are 4,000 aircraft. Now, let's take a look at what happened on American Airlines Flight 11. It began in Boston, and it took off on time. 81 people aboard, nine crew members, uh, two uh, nine flight attendants, and two pilots. And let's sort of track what happened with this flight. As it went across uh, Massachusetts and went down into the... Uh, uh, Albany area, actually up in the Adirondacks, it took a sharp dog leg. 
What's interesting about this flight is everything seemed to be normal. Flight at a, it was the altitude was about 29,000 feet, gaining speed at about uh, 450 knots. It took that sharp dog leg down across the Adirondacks straight for New York. Now, what will be interesting about this as this story unfolds will be, number one, listening to any air traffic control conversations to get a sense of what, if anything, uh, air traffic controllers were, were saying to this aircraft. Undoubtedly, this was spotted on the radar screens, of course. They had quite a bit of time to watch this plane as it went down toward New York. That's probably at least a 30-minute run there. And during the course of that time, those air traffic controllers and those radar installations, New York Center, as it is called, would have been uh, trying to contact American Airlines Flight 11 to indicate its intentions. Uh, it must have been a horrifying scene for them. They were probably trying to clear air traffic out of the area. Clearly, once those tapes become available, we'll have a little bit more knowledge. And if it is possible to locate any of the so-called black boxes, the flight data recorders, cockpit voice recorder, out of this particular aircraft, they'll obviously know more about what was going on on what must have been a very dramatic uh, flight indeed. Now, this is the first flight. This is the flight that uh, first impacted the first tower of the World Trade Center. And this is the first of four that we know about, of course, four air uh, hijackings, which led to uh, crashes and obviously a tremendous amount of damage. I'm getting this information from a company called FlightExplorer.com. They are compiling their archival radar information from this morning. And as it becomes available, we'll be able to show you the flight paths of the other three aircraft that are suspected in all of this. And we'll bring those to you as soon as we get that. Aaron? Uh, just a quick practical question. These tapes, of the cockpit tower communications, do they exist on the ground? Yes. They recorded it in control towers, and then there's a different set of tapes that exist on the plane. Exactly. It's, it's important to bring out there are two types of tapes in these incidents. The, the tapes on the ground are the ones that record the radio transmissions between the ground and the aircraft, and clearly the flight controllers would have been calling this aircraft numerous times, and, and this would have been the case for the three others if they deviated from their courses, uh, indicate, trying to get some indication as to what was wrong, why the pilot was changing course so dramatically. Now, what will be interesting to hear is if there is some sort of response from these aircraft, uh, this will uh, give us some clue as to who might have been in control of the plane at the time or if there might have been some sort of struggle aboard or if, it, if there was just a, a lack of a struggle. There's a lot of mystery here, obviously. Now, ultimately, uh, as they go through the, uh, the wreckage in these cases, uh, it's possible that uh, investigators, and there's a good chance because they have emergency locating uh, devices on them, they'll find these so-called black boxes. And on those black boxes, there might be much more information which might uh, give authorities some clues as to who might be responsible. Several different kinds of information. There's technical information in these black boxes, what the airplane was doing in a sense, but there's also communications between the cabin crew uh, that exist on those tapes, uh, what pilot was saying to co-pilot. Might, we might be able to hear, if these tapes are ever located, what the people who took control of these planes, and that's clearly what happened, seems clear that that's what happened, what they were saying, whether these tapes will ever be found, obviously we don't yet know. But that is part of what will happen in the next days. On this day, what is happening in both Washington and New York and in a field outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is a massive, massive rescue operation, a massive triage operation. Uh, thousands of people presumably have been hurt. Many people, we suspect, have died. Though many hours now since that first plane hit the Trade Center at uh, 8.48 Eastern Time, we have yet to hear from any official in the city uh, any estimate here in New York of the number of people who have been hurt. We just know that hospitals are inundated, that hospitals are running very low on blood, and they need help here. We know that uh, we know that the National Guard will be coming in here to New York to help in support of uh, the New York Police Department. Uh, we would add here that a number of members, and we don't know how many, but after the police and fire responded to these two planes hitting the Trade Center, uh, many police officers, many firefighters, many EMS personnel were in the area when the buildings collapsed. How many of them were hurt, we do not know. Uh, but we've been told now by two uh, officials or former officials with the city that, that any number of people, uh, police and fire officials, have been hurt as well. Uh, Judy in Washington. Judy Woodruff. Judy. And Aaron, uh, just picking up on your conversation with Miles O'Brien a moment ago and, and 
Perhaps you all referred to this, and I apologize if I'm repeating the Associated Press reporting on a passenger that was on United Flight 93. Now, this is the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. About 20 minutes before that plane crashed, a passenger with a cell phone locked in a bathroom actually called an emergency dispatcher and shouted into the cell phone, we are being hijacked, we're being hijacked. They apparently stayed on the phone with this passenger uh, up until the moment when the passenger heard some sort of a loud noise and then they lost they lost contact. That's just one more piece of the stories, the many, many, many stories that we are pulling together uh, as we watch these developments in Pennsylvania, here in Washington, and of course in New York City. And you just heard Aaron talking about uh, incomplete information about casualties, what hospitals are dealing with. Now these numbers I'm going to read you right now are, are only incomplete. We, we are just beginning to get this kind of information. We're told at Washington area hospitals right now, 53 injured, at least three more casualties on the way, although we have to believe that with uh, the commercial jetliner that crashed at the Pentagon or just in front of the Pentagon, and that was the uh, Boeing 757, and these are the these are the pictures of the Pentagon just outside the Pentagon. 58 passengers on board, four crew members and two pilots. It is impossible to believe that they did not all perish, and we don't know about others who work at the Pentagon who were in the part of that building uh, that was most affected when that commercial plane uh, went down. We, we are, uh, we've been talking with uh, uh, a number of people involved in, in rescue, and uh, right now we want to go to the president's statement. This took place just about an hour and 15 minutes ago. The president was on his way back to Washington from Florida. His plane touched down at an Air Force base in Louisiana, Barksdale Air Force Base near Shreveport. We can now report that information because he's since left Barksdale. But here is what President George W. Bush had to say in this statement. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status and we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens, and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake. We will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. President Bush uh, made that statement just about an hour and 20 minutes ago at Barksdale Air Force Base near Shreveport, Louisiana. That was an unplanned stop that the president made at that place uh, in order to talk with reporters, meet with others. Since then, Air Force One has taken off, President Bush being flown to an undisclosed location. We're told also that Secretary of State Colin Powell, who had been on his way back to the United States from Peru, being taken to an undisclosed location. Outside the Pentagon, CNN's military 
military affairs correspondent, Jamie McIntyre. And Jamie, you got very close to where that plane went down. That's right, Judy. A short uh, a, a while ago, I walked right up to next to the building where uh, uh, firefighters were still trying to put out the blaze. The, the fire, by the way, is still burning in some parts of the Pentagon. And I took a look at the huge gaping hole that's in this side of the Pentagon, in an area of the Pentagon that has been recently renovated, uh, part of a uh, multi-billion dollar renovation program here at the Pentagon. I could see parts of the airplane that crashed into the building, very small pieces of the plane on the heliport outside the, 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 uh, the building. The biggest piece I saw was about three feet uh, long. It was uh, silver and had been painted uh, green and red, but I could not see any identifying markings on the plane. I also saw a large piece of shattered glass. It appeared to be uh, a cockpit windshield or other window from the plane. Uh, when this uh, plane hit the Pentagon uh, this morning, according to the Pentagon spokesman uh, Craig Quigley, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld incredibly uh, is described as having run out of his office and down to ha actually help some of the victims onto stretchers until he was uh, ushered into the National Military Command Center, the secure uh, uh, nerve center or war room in, deep inside the Pentagon, where he remains at this time. Pentagon officials say he'll stay there for the time being. That is a place where all of U.S. intelligence comes in, and he has complete uh, command uh, with his commanders around the world. At the same time, the Pentagon has dispatched several warships out of port in Norfolk, including the U.S. Uh, the carriers uh, USS George Washington and U.S. Says, uh, uh, Kennedy. Uh, the, the ostensible reason for that, uh, to, uh, uh, the movement of those ships and their escort ships, is to move them from more vulnerable positions. But the Navy says they'll also hit some of the aircraft carriers up toward New York with the idea that they may be able to render some kind of assistance there, given the magnitude uh, of the tragedy there. Uh, back here, uh, the fight goes on to put out the, the fire inside the Pentagon. The, the heat from that blaze was described as absolutely intense, and the number of casualties here has still not been released. Uh, dozens of people uh, were taken away in ambulances, and the Pentagon is still not releasing any figures on, uh, on deaths. But clearly people who had offices in that uh, what is now a huge gaping hole in, uh, in the side of the Pentagon, uh, clearly there were some people killed in this, uh, in this tragedy. Judy? Jamie, Aaron was talking uh, earlier, one, or one of our correspondents was talking earlier, I think it, actually it was Bob Franken, with an eyewitness who said it appeared that that Boeing 757, the American jet, American Airlines jet, landed short of the Pentagon. Can you give us any better idea of how much of the plane actually impacted the building? You know, it, it, it might have appeared that way, but from my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. The only site uh, is the actual uh, side of the building that's crashed in, and as I said, the only pieces left uh, that you can see are, are small enough that you could pick up in your hand. Uh, there are no large uh, tail sections, wing sections, uh, a fuselage, nothing like that anywhere around, which would indicate that the entire plane crashed into the side of the